lookup chains are a matrix-based tool that have proven to be phenomenally useful in business analytics, marketing, advertising, and a lot of areas of science. So what are they and how can we use them to answer conditional probability questions in business analytics? Well, the typical application area of Markov change is to study quantities that vary over time. So if you are working in supply chain analytics and your main job is to study inventory control policies, you know that inventory will deplete randomly as demands come in. It gets replenished somewhat randomly depending on your control policy. And you might like to study how many items are in stock and how does that change from one day to another. Or maybe you're in customer service and you're studying the number of people that are waiting in queue at the uh, shopping center. So if you're at Kroger, how many different lanes do you have open in order to satisfy shoppers? How many queues have zero people in demand, five people in demand, and how is that changing over time? And if you are working in customer management, well, a markup chain could potentially be useful to help study what services customers have over time. So at any given point in time, they might subscribe to, say, one particular service, like streaming TV, streaming movies, uh, maybe 10 different services, streaming TV and movies, a phone service, a cable service, etc. So in business analytics, when we have some quantity that changes over time, well, one whole field is time series forecasting, but the problem that you're studying might be well suited to be being approached within the context of a Markov chain. So what is a Markov chain and how can we study it? What can we learn from it? Well, at its core, a Markov chain can be considered a system that is well summarized by what's referred to as a state. So we refer to as uh, something as the state of the system and we'll study how that changes over time. So if you're in advertising, you might be curious in studying how many people have, have heard about your product. The state of the system would be the number of people that have heard about it so far, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. How does that number evolve over time? If you're in customer service for Kroger and you're studying how many people are waiting at a checkout, well, the state of your system, the state of the queue, would be zero people in it, one person in it, two people in it, etc. If you're studying what people do on websites, how they bounce back and forth between different items, item details, reviews, the checkout, well, your markup chain could be just this series of web pages you have on your site. So customers visit various sites, so the home page, item details, and these can be taken to be as states of the markup chain. So you jump from one state to another. How does the state of the system evolve over time? And if you're like me and you want to get a complete set of Magic the Gathering cards, well, you could represent your collection with a Markov chain. The state of the system would be the number of cards that you've collected so far. So you start out at zero, go up to one, two, three, four, etc., all the way until you have a complete set. So if we can nicely describe a system by its state, and that state evolves over time, then we might have something that plays well with Markov chain terminology. So what we imagine is that each step of the system, after some amount of time, the state transitions from one value to another. So the number of people that might have heard of the product transitions from 105 one day to 113 on another day. If I open up a Magic the Gathering booster pack, the number of unique cards I have in my collection might go up from, say, 35 to 42. And if we're studying a web page, well, at the next transition that the system undergoes, the state of the system might be the home page to item details, or the checkout page back to the product details. So at each step, the system is going to transition from one state to another, and we're going to describe the probability of those transitions with some numbers that are either based on data or based on logic. So if we can describe a system as a sequence of states that transition from one state to another, then we might be dealing with the Markov chain. The one additional requirement that we have about these states is the following, and I think it actually nicely provides a great philosophy to live by. So, given the present, the future is independent of the past.
That sounds like a pretty deep statement and actually really good advice for your life. You know, just let go uh, maybe your past mistakes, your past fumbles. What matters is the here and now. Your future depends not really on your collection of past mistakes, but where you are in the present. So live for those dreams, work towards your goals, all that great stuff. And that really is the philosophy of a Markov chain. If we are dealing with a system that can be nicely summarized by various states, and if the next state the system is going to be in is independent of the past history of states, and it only depends on what the current state of the system is, well, then we have a Markov chain. So maybe that website would be well modeled by a Markov chain. Given that the customer is currently on the item details page, can we fully describe the probabilities of where that customer is going to go to next? If those probabilities don't matter on what the past history of sites visited on that website is, well, we have a Markov chain. If we're looking at the number of people in a queue and we see that there are five people waiting in line, well, if we can describe the probability that the next time we see a change that we either have four people in the queue, someone's left, we have 10 people in the queue. Well, I guess it would be six people in the queue, one additional person arrived. If those probabilities only matter on the fact that currently there's five people in the queue and not on the past history of what that queue liked, well, then we have a Markov chain. So given the present, the future is independent of the past, great words to live by. And if we come up with a selection of states, well, we can model this system as a Markov chain. So where do we see Markov chain in business analytics? Well, inventory control, if we model the amount of inventory we have on hand as a Markov chain, well, the amount of inventory we have at the beginning of the day might transition into any uh, collection of numbers with various probabilities. If that transition going from five to 10 or five to three is independent of the past sequence of inventories on hand at the start of the day, we got a Markov chain. If we're studying customer loyalty, so let's say we're really into bounce dryer sheets, but we might go in and try out, uh, say, Snuggle or maybe other brands. Maybe our brand loyalty bounces back and forth between different brands here. And if the next brand that we're going to get really into is independent of what our past history of brand choice was, it only depends on what our current favorite brand is, well, then we're dealing with a Markov chain. So insurance companies model their customers as a markup chain. They go from states being healthy, disabled, dead, and they transition between them kind of back and forth. Although not really from dead because no one comes back to be a zombie. But we do see markup chains a lot in business analytics. And in fact, markup chains have been studied or have been used to help study and strategize about how to reopen schools, reopen colleges with the looming threat of COVID-19. So here's a paper that was recently published in August. And if we go and look to see, well, how are they approaching uh, the evolution of COVID-19 at a university? They were modeling it as a sequence of states that transition from one to another. Now, that's not a very well-labeled plot. State one is basically the students arrive, let's say, to the university. So there's state one. They get tested and they might have to go into isolation or they might go to a particular class. And if we assume that where the state is going to be next, that's going to be independent of the past history of states, and it only depends on what state we're in right now, then we have a Markov chain. So Markov chains have seen pretty wide use in business analytics. One of my favorite examples is the Pepsi versus Coke question. So each of you might have a favorite soda to drink, and I know that my loyalty has switched over the years. Some years I've been a Coke fan, other years I've been a Pepsi fan, and maybe we could model this transition, model the current state of the system, what my favorite brand is, with a Markov chain. Now, if we are dealing with a Markov chain, we can usually very quickly summarize what that Markov chain looks like with a transition diagram. And so here would be a great transition diagram to represent how loyalty goes between Coke and Pepsi products. So the diagram is letting us know that if currently we're a Coke fan, there's a 90% chance at the next step, maybe the next month, however step is being measured, a 90% chance we're going to remain a Coke fan, we'll transition back into Coke, and there's a 10% chance that we'll defect and become a Pepsi fan. Likewise, if we're currently in the Pepsi state, there's a 70% chance at the next step 
will stay in the Pepsi state and a 30% chance that we'll transition and become a Coke fan. So you could study brand loyalty with markup chains potentially. And people have studied the stock market with markup chains as well. So we could imagine that the stock market could be characterized by one of three states, maybe a bull market, a bear market, or a stagnant market. And if we represent those states as circles, well, we can draw transitions from one state to another and label them with probabilities to fully describe how that system evolves. So if currently we're in a bear market at the next step, if that's the next trading day, if it's the next week, however step is being defined, this Markov chain is saying we have an 80% chance of staying in a bear market, we have a 5% chance of transitioning into a stagnant market, and we'd have a 15% chance of transitioning into a bull market. So when we are dealing with the Markov chain, we do like to summarize it with a transition diagram that spells out what states of the system are possible and what are the probabilities of going from one state to another. So when we describe mathematically a Markov chain, we actually describe it with a matrix. So we have rows and we have columns. The rows and the columns of a Markov chain are going to correspond to the states of the system. And what we're going to do is populate the entries of that matrix with transition probabilities. So how likely is it to go from one state to another? So let's look at the simple example where customers were transitioning between being loyal to Coke and being loyal to Pepsi. So how could we represent this as a matrix? Well, let's represent this as a two by two matrix because we have two states. What we're going to do is we're going to label the rows after the two states, and the rows are going to represent the current state the system is in. The columns are going to be labeled with those two states. That's going to represent the next state the system is going to be in. So when I look at the number assigned to Pepsi on the rows and Coke along the columns, that means there's a 30% chance that if I'm currently in the Pepsi state, that I'll transition into the Coke state. If I'm currently in the Coke state, well, there's a 90% chance I'm gonna stay in the Coke state on the next transition, and a 10% chance I'll switch to Pepsi in the next transition. So, key thing is that the rows represent the current state, where you're at right now, the columns represent the next state, and the entries in that matrix represent those transition probabilities. How likely are you to go from one state to another in the next transition. So there's an easy check to make sure that you're dealing with a valid transition matrix because the row numbers are letting you know the probability of going from a certain state to all of the others. The numbers inside of a row must sum to one because at that next transition, we have to end up in a certain state. So if I sum up all the probabilities of going into whatever collection of states I have, the sum of those is gonna have to equal to one. And we see that here for the Pepsi versus Coke case. All right, well, let's kind of pursue this. Let's look at a transition matrix for a website example, a very simple website. Let's imagine that we want to model a website with just four states. We have the home page, we have the item details page, the reviews page, and a checkout page. So maybe we're a small local celebrity, we have a page that sells merch, but there's only one item that we're selling right now, and so we only have four pages on our website. Well, the transition diagram tells us everything that we need to know about the likelihood of a customer going from one page to another. So for instance, if they're currently on the home page, there's a 10% chance that they'll end up on the item reviews page. That's just the number we're using to model this process. If they're currently on the home page, there's an 80% chance of heading to an item details page. If they're currently on the reviews page, well, there's a 10% chance that they'll head back to the home page, a 30% chance, according to this model, that they'll head to the checkout page. So visually, this makes sense. It describes how to go from one state to another. If we want to analyze this system, we'll represent that markup chain with the transition matrix. So once again, the rows are labeling the current page that the customer is on, and the columns are represent the next page that the customer is gonna go to. So if that customer is currently on the reviews page, it's letting us know there's a 10% chance the customer will next visit the home page, 60% chance the next page visits the item details, and a 30% chance that the next page is the checkout.
So these row totals are going to sum to one because the customer has to go somewhere regardless of what page they're currently on. All right, well, what about studying the process of collecting a complete set of something? So you might have opened a lot of boxes of cereal as a kid, and a very popular cereal, cereal promotion is to have maybe three different prizes kind of sealed away inside of a cereal box. So if you want to collect them all, well, you're going to have to buy a lot of cereal here. Well, we could represent the uh, kind of process here, collecting different prizes from these cereal boxes as a Markov chain with states 0, 1, 2, and 3. 0 when we haven't opened up any cereal boxes quite yet. When we open our first one, well, if we represent the state of the system as the number of unique prizes that we've collected, we'll transition from 0 to 1. So that arrow has a 100% chance associated with it. When we have one unique prize, well, we're either going to stay in one after we open up our next cereal box, or we'll transition into two. There's going to be a one-third chance that we'll stay in state one, a one-third chance that we'll open up a cereal box with a prize we already have, and a two-thirds chance that we'll get something new, and we'll go from one to two unique prizes. Once we're in state two, well, now there's a two-thirds chance we'll stay in state two once we open up a new cereal box, and a one-third chance that we'll complete that set. And then once we're in state three, well, we're always going to be in state three. No matter how many more transitions that we perform, no matter how many more cereal boxes that we open, we have that complete set. We have those three unique items. So we could capture that with a transition matrix. We have state zero representing the state that we are currently in, basically before opening up any cereal, having a 100% chance of transitioning into state one. Once we open that first cereal box, we'll have one unique item. Once we have two unique items, we're in state two. Well, there's zero chance of going back to zero. Once we've collected them, they're ours forever. Zero percent chance of losing one. A two-thirds chance of remaining at two, because we already have two of those three prizes already. And a one-third chance of completing the set and transitioning from two to three. And then once we're in state three, a hundred percent chance of staying in state three from then on. All right, so the transition matrix is all we need to know about the probability of ending up in some state at the next transition based on where we're currently at. But sometimes we have much more sophisticated questions. We might like to know, okay, well, what's the probability that the Markov chain is going to be in state four after eight transitions? If we're using a Markov chain to study, say, inventory control, our state of the system is the amount of inventory that's in the store at store opening at the beginning of the day. We might have four items right now. We're going to let five days pass. Some random demands are going to come in. Maybe some restocks will happen as well. What's the probability that the amount of inventory at the start of the day, five days in the future after five transitions, is going to be eight? What's the probability I'll go from four to eight? So if we represent the Markov chain with its transition matrix, it turns out that there's a remarkably easy way to get the probabilities of these multi-step transitions, and it just involves a bit of matrix algebra. All we really have to do is, if our matrix uh, of pro transition probabilities is referred to as P, if we want to know what's the probability of being in a certain state after n transitions, we just have to multiply p by itself n total times, or for shorthand, raising p to the n power, and then looking at the appropriate element. So one of the most important equations for analysis of Markov chains, if I want to know the probability I'll be in state j after n steps, given that I'm currently in state i right now, well, take your transition matrix, multiply by itself n times to represent those n transitions, and then look at the element in row i and column j. i because that's the row, that's where we're currently at, and j the column because that's describing where the Markov chain is headed to. I want to look at an example of an elevator. So let's imagine that we have an elevator that is servicing a four-story building. And let's let the state of the system just be the floor that the elevator is currently on. So if the elevator is currently on floor one, well, it might end up on floor two after the next trip, floor three or floor four. If it's on floor three, it might go back to floor one, it might go to floor two, it might go up to floor four. We have the full set of probabilities that tell us 
what floor the elevator might go to next based on what floor it's currently on. And so I might have the question, all right, I know the elevator is on floor number one right now. What's the probability that the elevator will be on floor three in two steps? And if I really wanted to, I could brute force this answer because the number of paths from floor one to floor three in exactly two steps is limited. So to go from floor one to floor three in two steps, my sequence would have to be floor one to floor two, then to floor three, that's one way, or floor one to floor four to floor three, that's the other way. There's no other way to actually get from floor one to floor three in two steps. It's either one, two, three, or one, four, three, and that's because the elevator doesn't stay on the same floor from one state to the next. There's no arrow connecting the state back to itself. So in this case, if I'm gonna treat this as a Markov chain, future states are independent of the past sequence of states the Markov chain has been in, all that matters is right now, I can actually get that probability really quite quickly. So what's the probability of the sequence, floor one to floor two to floor three? Well, going to floor one to two has a 5% chance, Going from floor two to floor three has a 15% chance. If I wanna multiply those two numbers together, that'll give me the probability of the transition as a whole. Because the probability of going from floor two to floor three is independent of where the elevator was before. So these two events, going from floor one to floor two on the first step and floor two to floor three on the second step are independent. I get to multiply the probabilities of independent events when I wanna know the probability of two things happening. So the probability of going from floor one to floor three through floor two is that 0.05 times 0.15. Going from floor one to floor three through floor four, well, that's gonna be the 5% times the 15%, actually once again. So it works out to be the same number. So two times 0.05 times 0.15. Don't need markup chains for that. But I might have a much more complicated question. What about after eight transitions? That's gonna be a lot of different paths to get there. So let's see how to answer this question actually using matrices and using that transition matrix specifically. So I've captured that transition diagram in terms of our transition matrix, letting us know based on where, where the elevator is now, the row labels, where is the elevator going to end up after its next trip, the column labels, and I'm trying to answer the question, what's the probability the elevator will be on floor three in two steps? It's on floor one right now. So let's try to break this down mathematically using our rules of probability and then show that this is actually the same sequence of calculations that you need to do when you perform matrix multiplication. So here's the probability that I want to answer. Given that I'm floor number one right now, what's the probability I'll be on floor three in two steps? All right, well, that's a difficult question to answer because that's going to depend on what floor the elevator visits next after one step. So we've answered questions like this before where it's like, I don't know what that probability is, but I can use partitioning to help figure it out. And so I'll do that here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition this probability on where the elevator heads to next. So what's the probability that will be in floor three in two steps given that I'm in st uh, floor one right now? Let's partition on where the elevator goes after for its first trip. Let's just go through and enumerate, okay, well, it might be on in floor number one next or floor two next or floor three next or floor four next. Some of these have probabilities of zero, but I'm just partitioning going over every single possible um, event that could potentially occur here. So I can partition on where that elevator is going to next, and then I can kind of simplify. It doesn't look very simple here, but I can rewrite those probabilities in terms of probabilities that I can read off the transition matrix. So if I wanna know, well, what's the probability I'll be on floor three in two steps and on one next, given that I'm on floor number one now, the very first line of this monstrously long equation, well, I can just expand that. That would be the probability I would be on floor three in two steps, given that I'm on floor number one now, and I'm on floor number one next, times the probability that I'm on floor one next, given that I'm on floor one right now. Now, 
Those are things I can simplify a little bit because one thing I know about the Markov chain, is the future is independent of the past given the present. So the probability that I'll be on floor three in two steps given that I'm on floor one now and floor one next, well, I can simplify that to just be the probability I'll be on floor three in two steps given that I'm on floor one for my next trip. Because it doesn't matter what happened more than one step prior, if I want to know what happens in two steps, all I really need to know is where that markup chain is, where that elevator is on the next step, the one that uh, uh, immediately precedes the step that I'm asking the question of. And this is a quantity I can read off that transition matrix. The probability of being on floor three in two steps, given that I'm on floor one next, well, that's just going to be going back to my transition matrix, I'm in floor one next, I'm in floor three, two steps from now, so the following step from next, that's gonna be the 0.9. And then the second part of that equation, the probability that I'm on floor one next, given that I'm on floor one right now, well, that turned out to be zero, because given I'm on floor one right now, there's no chance my next trip drops me off on floor one. The floor has to change based on my model here. So I can rewrite these conditional probabilities as actually just elements of the transition matrix. So at the end of the day, here's what I end up finding. The probability that I'll be on floor three in two steps, given that I'm on floor one right now, can be written as the product and sum of these eight different elements of that transition matrix. So is this, has that helped us? Like, why, why are we doing this here? Well, it turns out that this has a very familiar form. If you're really good at matrix multiplication and you can think back to, okay, well, what was the mechanics behind multiplying two matrices together, you will actually identify that this particular sequence of products and sums corresponds to the exact same thing as multiplying a particular row of the left matrix by a particular column of the right matrix when we're multiplying two matrices together. So it turns out the upshot of all of this is, is that if you do have a more complicated question about your Markov chain, so what state is the Markov chain going to be in, n steps in the future, 10, 20, 100, you can answer this very quickly by taking your transition probability matrix, multiplying it by itself n times, however many steps you're looking ahead, and then looking at the relevant element. So it turns out that matrix multiplication, extremely useful for studying the evolution of Markov chains here. And so how can we pull this off in R? Obviously, we're not going to be multiplying matrices by hand here. So let's go ahead and calculate this probability using what we know in R about how to represent matrices. So if I head on over to R, what I have is the transition matrix already embedded in the associated .R file with these slides. So if I have that matrix in there, I'm just printing it out to the screen. That's the transition matrix that we are uh, used to. So this tells me the probability of going to the next floor based on what floor I'm currently on. If I take P and multiply by itself, that's going to let me know, well, where am I going to be after two trips? The row is going to label, OK, where am I right now? And the columns are going to label where that elevator ends up after two trips. And so what we find is that if I'm on floor one right now, what's the probability I'll end up on floor three after two steps? That's the 0 0.015. So if I wanted to know, well, where's the elevator likely to be after five trips? I could multiply P by itself five different times and take a look. So here's my interpretation. Let's say that I know the elevator is on floor number two right now. 
What's the probability that after five trips, it's gonna be on floor four? Well, I'll look at the row two, column four, and I see that it's right at about 10.5% or so. Now, one thing that R doesn't seem to have is a function that multiplies a matrix by itself a certain number of times. In essence, taking a matrix and raising it to a certain power. So in the associated.r file, I've written one for us to use. It's called matrix.pow, and the way that you want to use it is to pass as the very first argument the transition matrix that you've defined, and as the second argument, the number of steps ahead that you're looking. So if I wanted to know, well, after 40 trips, where is this elevator likely to be? I would multiply P by itself 40 times. It's done this quite quickly. So if I'm on floor number two right now, that's where the elevator's at right now, after 40 trips, there's a 40.56% chance of ending up on floor number three. And actually we've discovered something somewhat intriguing. Notice that regardless of where the elevator is currently on, if it's currently on floor one, two, three, or four, after 40 steps, the probability that the elevator will be on floor one, or floor two, or floor three, or floor four, seems to be independent of where it currently is. You know, regardless if we're on floor one, two, three, or four, there's an 8.6% chance that after 40 trips, we're gonna be on floor four. And so we're actually discovering something quite interesting about a Markov chain is that they have associated steady state probabilities with many of them. Some systems modeled by Markov chains have steady state probabilities that let you know in the long run, you know, what fraction of transitions are into a particular state. So we've discovered actually the steady state probabilities for this elevator problem. If I don't really know where the elevator is right now, you know, looking ahead hundreds, thousands of steps, just keeping track of what fraction of states the elevator happens to be in, I would find that in the long run, the elevator would be on floor one about 42% of the time, floor two about 8.6% of the time, etc., etc. And so that's where we're headed to next here. So if we have a Markov chain that's able to essentially transition from one state to another at any point in time, in other words, it doesn't get stuck in a particular state, what's known as an absorbing state, then we can find steady state probabilities, the long run fraction of transitions that are into a particular state, or just the fraction of, uh, of the time the chain is in any particular state. Now, sometimes this trick actually isn't gonna work, and we'll talk about cases where it doesn't work, in which case it's actually best to go dust off our chops as to what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are with matrices, because it turns out that we can get the steady state probabilities of a Markov chain by looking at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the transition matrix. So when we formalize what it means to be a steady state probability, here's the equation that captures this. Let's let pi be a matrix of the steady state probabilities. Basically, the first entry would be the steady state probability of being in state one, the second entry, steady state probability of being in state two, et cetera, et cetera. To be a steady state probability, well, if you multiply that by the transition matrix, nothing really changes. If you're in steady state, you're kind of in steady state forever. So that transition matrix doesn't really play a role in that anymore. And so what that means is that if I take the uh, uh, matrix of steady state probabilities and multiply it by that transition matrix, I should just get the steady state probabilities back. I'm in steady state, evolving the uh, system one more time. I'm still in steady state here. So if I look at this equation and I stare at it you know, really hard, I can actually start to see an analogy with the equation that defines the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix. Now, normally our defining equation for getting the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A is follows. So A times V equals to lambda times V. When we can find solutions to this equation, solutions for the lambdas and the Vs, we've discovered eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Well, let's do a little bit of matrix algebra here. As long as you do the same thing to both sides of an equation, we're always good to go. So let's take the transposes of both sides of the equation. 
then we get the product of AD transpose equaling to lambda, which is a number of the scalar. It doesn't get transpose here. Times the transpose of the eigenvector. Okay, well, we can expand the transpose and bring it inside the parentheses using our matrix algebra tricks. So write the equation as B transpose, A transpose equals lambda, B transpose. Well, that looks a lot like our equation that defines what the steady state probabilities are, as long as we take lambda equal to 1, and we have essentially the transpose of V being our vector of steady state probabilities. So here's our connection. You know, all of those useful tricks that we discussed about matrices, all those properties like determinants, eigenvalues, rank, etc., they can play a part in helping us analyze the long-run behavior of certain types of Markov chains, and essentially we can get the steady state probabilities. So how do we do that? Well, we define our transition matrix, and then what we'll do is we'll ask, hey, what are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the transpose of the transition matrix? So when we ask that in R, well, it's going to report back a bunch of things. Now, remember, if we have an n by n square matrix, there's going to be n different eigenvalues and n associated eigenvectors. And so we're going to have to look for the right one. There's obviously only one vector of steady state probabilities. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the results of taking the eigen of transpose of our transition matrix, and we're going to hunt for where we find the eigenvalue exactly equal to 1. Once we found that, that lets us know, okay, well, here's going to be the eigenvector that's going to help us out in getting those steady state probabilities. So in this case, the very first element of the eigenvalues is equal to 1. So the very first eigenvector, this first column here, is going to be our eigenvector of interest. Now, looking at this eigenvector, we see all negative components. So obviously, this isn't immediately the vector of steady state probabilities, because probabilities can't be negative. But here's how we can get them. All we need to do is take the entries we find in that column and divide each entry by the sum of all of them. So if we left arrow into, say, little p, our eigenvector of interest, and then take p over the sum of p, the sum over all the elements of p, that's going to give us our steady state probabilities. And you'll notice in this case, we converge to the same set of probabilities here if we took the transition matrix and raised it to a really high power, or if we asked for the eigenvalues of the transpose of the transition matrix, specifically the eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue of 1. All right, so as I was saying, taking a transition matrix and raising it to a really high power very often does give you the steady state probabilities, but not always, because there are Markov chains that this trick just sometimes doesn't really work on. So the first type of matrix where this doesn't work on is known as a periodic matrix. So a periodic matrix or a periodic Markov chain is one where you can only transition into certain uh, states on certain transition numbers. So what does that mean? Best seen through a diagram. So this top Markov chain, not a very interesting Markov chain. We start off, say, in state 1, 100% chance of going to state 2, 100% chance of going to state 3. We're basically just doing 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So in this case, if I know I'm in state 1 right now, then I'm going to be in state 1 after one, two, three transitions, after four, five, six transitions, after seven, eight, nine transitions, only after transitions that are a multiple of three will I ever be allowed to re-enter state number one. Likewise, I'm not going to be able to enter in state two on any transition I have in mind. That's only going to happen on transition, say, two, or the, after the, uh, the, with the second state, the fifth state, the eighth state, etc. So the full set of states of this Markov chain aren't equally accessible at all times. And so we have this periodicity here. So the Markov chain can only enter certain states on certain transitions. This is a periodic Markov chain. Now, for a more sophisticated example, consider this chain with four states, state one, two, three, and four. Now, if we look really closely at this, if we're in state one right now, we can only transition to state 2 or state 4 here. If we're in state 2, we can only transition to state 3 or state 1. State 3 can only go to 2 or 4. And state 4 can go to 1 or it can go to 3. 
So in effect, if we are in, in an odd numbered state, we can only transition into an even numbered state and vice versa. If we're currently in an even numbered state, we can only transition into an odd numbered state. So I immediately know that I must be dealing with a periodic Markov chain here because transitions to certain states are only going to be allowed after certain numbers of transitions. If I start out in state 1, I know I can only end up back in state 1 after an even number of transitions, after two transitions, after four, after six, etc. So if we're dealing with a periodic Markov chain, well, we can still take that transition matrix and raise it to a really high power, but we're not going to get the steady state probabilities out. For that 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 Markov chain, here I'm taking the uh, transition matrix and raising it to the 1,000th power, but these clearly aren't the steady state probabilities. Just from logic alone, if I'm going 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, I know that in the long run, one third of the time, I'm going to be in state 1, one third of the time, I'm going to be in state 2. So raising the matrix to a high power, the transition matrix to a high power, failed me. Didn't get me there. But notice, if I were to take the eigenvalues of the transpose of that transition matrix, go and hunt for the eigenvalue that equals to 1, this guy right here, what I find is that the entries in the eigenvector associated with that are all identical. So they must all have the same probability in the long run. I've discovered you know, kind of what I could intuitively figure out about those steady state probabilities. Okay, another type of Markov chain where taking that uh, transition matrix, raising it to a really high power, won't get you those steady state probabilities is when we're dealing with a reducible Markov chain. Now, the way that I like thinking of a reducible Markov chain is that it's essentially just two separate independent Markov chains just being encompassed by a single model. So I think visually this makes a lot of sense. Let's imagine that we have four states in our system here, state one, two, three, and four. But the way that the system works is that if you're in state one, you can only transition back into state one or state two. If you're in state two, you can only go back to state one or stay in state two. And then if you're in three, you can only stay in three or go to four. If you're in four, stay in four, go back to three. In this case, there's no way to go from that cluster of states giving one and two to that cluster of states giving three and four. They're not communicating with one another. We can essentially reduce this into two just independent Markov chains. So when we have that case, well, if we take that uh, transition matrix and raise it up to a really high power, well, here's what we would see for this example right here. We would see something a little bit puzzling. Not quite the steady state probabilities, because actually the steady state probabilities kind of depend on what that initial state was, which contradicts the idea of what steady state probabilities are. They're supposed to be independent of where you're currently at right now. But we see like these little blocks in the, uh, that matrix that been, that's been raised up to a really high power. So it didn't really work out very well for us here. So if we are in the state 1, 2 cluster here, in the long run, 45.45% of the time, we're going to be in state 1, 54.5% chance we'll be in state 2. If we happen to start out in the 3, 4 cluster, here are the steady state probabilities. We just had to identify that, hey, this is a reducible chain that we're dealing with. The eigenvector approach, well, kind of figured that out. So if we write out our transition matrix and then say, hey, give me those eigenvalues of the transpose, of that transition matrix. Well, I go hunt for where I find the eigenvalue equal to one. And in this case, I see that there's two of them. The fact that there's two eigenvalues that are equal to one means that I'm dealing with a reducible Markov chain, and this essentially separates into two independent chains. So I have two sets of steady state probabilities. Well, this first one gives me the steady state probabilities of being in that one, two cluster after I appropriately normalize that, take P divided by the sum of P. And likewise, the numbers that I see in this second column here, with this associated with the second eigenvalue of 1, I would get the steady state probabilities that I saw on the last slide. Now, if I do have a Markov chain where I have an absorbing state, basically a state that if I transition into, I'm stuck there forever, I'm going to ask a different set of questions. So if my Markov chain has one or more absorbing states, eventually I'm going to wind up in one of them. I'm going to end there forever. 
So questions that I might want to know is, well, how many steps does it take on average in order to be absorbed? You know, what's the probability I'll pass through state seven on my way to being absorbed here? If there's more than one absorbing state, well, what's the probability of ending up in either of those absorbing states? So where would we see absorbing states in the real world? Well, if we're doing inventory control, let's imagine we're trying to liquidate some sort of inventory. We're never going to restock it. If we represent the inventory as the state of the Markov chain, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., once we get into state 0, we're stuck there forever. Once we're out of product, that's it. We're not restocking. We're going to be in state 0 forever. Likewise, if we're trying to get that complete set of Magic the Gathering cards, if the state of our system is the number of unique cards we've collected so far, well, once we end up in the state corresponding to a complete set, we're there forever. Nothing's going to break that. We're not collecting any new cards. So once we're in that state, we've been absorbed. We stay in that state indefinitely. And then one of my favorite applications, if you want to use Markov chains to study the amount of money you have as you're gambling, you win bets, you lose bets, the games are independent of one another, so your future bankrolls are independent of your past bankrolls. All that matters is what you have right now, because you might either win or lose. That'll let you know what that next bankroll is going to be. Well, if you are going to sit down at a table and either keep playing until you double your money or you go broke, well, we'd have two absorbing states. If we end up in a state that corresponds to us doubling our money, we're done. We get up, we leave the table, we stay in that state, double money forever. Likewise, if we keep playing, we lose all our money, we're bankrupt, we end up in the state corresponding to bankruptcy, then we're there forever. Unless we go you know, to the ATM, get a little bit more money, and keep playing. Shouldn't do that. Don't ever try to chase your losses. I have friends that have lost a lot of money that way. Sorry, Brian. All right, so how do we do our analysis of absorbing states? What do they look like when we talk about transition diagrams? Well, an absorbing state is just going to be a state where there's a single arrow coming out of it, and that arrow just points back to itself. So here's the transition diagram corresponding to completing that set of three prizes. When you open up a cereal box, we start out in state zero, 100% chance we transition to state one. When we open that first box, get our first unique prize. And then once we transition to state three, three unique prizes, we're there forever. No matter uh, how many additional boxes of cereal we open up, there's never going to be anything new. We have all three of them. So we have that arrow that's pointing back to state three with 100% chance. So if we did something silly, like try to find steady state probabilities with the prize collecting problem, here's what we'd end up finding if we translated that transition matrix into R and then asked it to raise that transition matrix to a really high power to get those steady state probabilities, what we would find if we zapped those really small elements is that regardless of the state that we started out in, there's a 100% chance that we'll end up in state four here. So in this case, the states are kind of confusingly labeled. State one is having zero unique uh, prizes. State two is having one unique prize. And so in some sense, this does get it right here. You know, there's a 100% chance of having a complete set after, you know, a thousand different transitions, opening up a thousand different serial boxes. But looking at steady state probabilities isn't where we really want to be when we're analyzing these sorts of Markov chains. So. How do we do the analysis? Well, what we're going to do is to take the transition matrix and split it up into what's known as canonical form. We're going to split up the states into transient states and absorbing states. And we're going to rewrite the transition matrix in a special way that will unlock the ability to answer the questions that we have. Like, what absorbing state are we going to end up in? How many steps is it going to take to get absorbed, etc.? So let's revisit the website problem, but add in two additional states to add a bit of realism. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that at the checkout phase, one of two things might end up happening. So after they're at the checkout phase, they might actually go and make a purchase, in which case we're going to say there's a 10% chance of that actually occurring. Given they're on the checkout page, 10% chance of making a purchase. And there's some other chances of going and revisiting other of those pages. But we're also going to add in an additional state that corresponds to no purchase, basically leaving that website forever. And we're going to put transitions from all of those pages, the home page, item details, etc., to this no purchase state. 
which basically represents you know just ditching the website. So if I were to update the transition diagram, I've added these two additional new states, basically making a purchase and then kind of leaving the website after that, and then just not making a purchase. And both of these are going to be absorbing states. So once we transition into no purchase, essentially leaving the website, we're there forever. We're stuck in that absorbing state. If it just so happens that the trajectory of the customer leads them into the purchase state, they've purchased the item, well, they stay in that purchase state forever. We're not tracking what their future behavior is after that. So what do we need to do to do the analysis? Well, canonical form groups together all the transient states, basically states where you can actually leave and uh, go visit somewhere else, and absorbing states, the states that once you're in, you're in there forever. So you're going to reorder the states of your Markov chain so that all the transient ones are up on top and the absorbing ones are down on the bottom, at least when it comes to row labels. Then you'll fill in the values for transient to transient transitions, transient to absorbing transitions, and absorbing to absorbing, that's just going to be the identity matrix. You know, Once you're in an absorbing state, you're in that same state forever, so there'll be a 1 on that diagonal. So what we'll do is we'll call the submatrix of transient to transient state transitions the transient matrix. And we'll abbreviate that by capital T. We'll abbreviate the submatrix of transitions from transient states to absorbing states. We'll represent that as the matrix R. And we're going to use both T and R to do our analysis. So with the website example, I've grouped together the four transient states, home, item details, review, and checkout to be the first four rows, with purchase and no purchase to be the final two. I've put a nice square matrix that shows the transient to transient transitions, four by four. And then our R matrix here has four rows, two columns to represent transitions from the four transient states to the two absorbing states, the purchase and the no purchase states. So. T looks like this, R looks like this. What do we do with them? How do we do the analysis? Well, one more matrix that we need to calculate called the fundamental matrix. And we're going to represent that by N. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the size of the T matrix, an N by N matrix, the number of transitory states that we have. That's the number of rows and columns. And we're going to create an equally sized identity matrix. We're going to subtract the two from each other and take the inverse of that matrix. And the elements of this fundamental matrix answer some pretty interesting questions that we might have about the system that we're studying. So if we looked at the entry in row 1 and column 4, let's say, so n bracket 1 comma 4, the value in the first row, fourth column, that's going to tell us the expected number of times that the system will visit transient state J if we start out in transient state I right now. So N14, the value in the first row and fourth column, is right at about 0.24. So that lets us know that if currently we're in state 1, we're expected to visit state 4 about 0.24 times before being absorbed, less than 1. So those entries, n, i, j, let you know the expected number of times you're expected to visit state j, given that you are in state i right now. The values along the diagonal of the fundamental matrix, n, i, i, where i is the same value, is going to let you know the expected number of times that you're just in transient state i uh, before you know, being absorbed here. So n, 3, 3 here is 1.25. That lets you know that if you're currently in state 3, well, you expect to visit state 3 a total of 1.25 times before being absorbed. One for you're there right now, and then an additional 0.25 times. All right, what else can we get out of here? Well, we can take the sums of all the values in a particular row. That'll tell us the expected number of steps that it'll take to be absorbed from that state. So if I were to ask sum n bracket 1 comma, that lets me know that if currently I'm in state 1, I think that's the home page, then I expect to be absorbed after 2.8 transitions. So I'll leave home to go to item details or checkouts. Uh, I either eventually get absorbed by the purchase or, or no purchase states, and it looks like I'm going to visit a total of 2.8 states before absorption. 
All right, and then finally, the ratio between two of these elements also tells us something interesting. So if I look at the ratio Nij over Njj, that's the probability that we'll ever visit the transient state J, given that I'm currently in state I now. So n1 bracket 4 over n bracket 4, 4 lets me know that if I'm currently in state 1, the probability that I'll ever visit state 4 before being absorbed is right at about 20.5%. Now, we can also answer questions about which of the absorbing states we'll end up in. So there'll be a certain probability for each one of them. What we'll do is we'll calculate an additional matrix called the B matrix. Take the fundamental matrix, multiply it by R, and then what those elements tell us are the absorption probabilities. So specifically, the value in the ith row and the jth column, bij, lets us know that if we're currently in state i, what the probability of being absorbed in absorbing state j. So in this example, we have one state being purchase, another state being no purchase. Specifically, the absorbing state one corresponds to making a purchase, Absorbing state 2 corresponds to leaving the site forever, not making a purchase. If we construct the B matrix in this case, here are the values. So remember, state 1 corresponded to the home page. So someone who's currently on the home page right now, according to this Markov chain model, has a 2.4% chance of making a purchase and a 97.6% chance of being absorbed in the other state, basically leaving the website forever, not making a purchase here. If instead they're on the checkout site, which is state number four here, well, the model is saying that there's an 11.7% chance of eventually making a purchase, being absorbed into that state, and about an 88.3% chance of just leaving the site forever. And you might say, well, now just wait a minute, because if I went back to the transition matrix, if we looked at the row for checkout and the probability of ending in the purchase state here, that's 10%. Why is this number different? Why is that a little bit higher? Well, remember, from the checkout state, you can go back to other states as well, other sites. So from checkout, you can go to home, item details, back to checkout, back to uh, reviews, back to checkout. This is letting you know, eventually you're gonna get absorbed. At some point, you might bounce around for a while, but there's an 11.7% chance of being absorbed into the purchase state if currently you're in the checkout. So 